So from now until the end of our lecture series, we are moving into a period of time where we're going to be discussing the period of time immediately before and during World War II. This is a period of human history in which a lot of truly horrific things are occurring. And I think it is, frankly, irresponsible to talk about this period of history without discussing the horrors that occur, and especially talking about how and why those things occur. Uh, this lecture, tomorrow's lecture, Monday's lecture, it is going to contain some really deeply heavy topics. And these heavy topics might be ones that some of you have a pretty personal connection to. My big request for you, as we are moving into some heavier topics, is that each of you remember that there are many people present, there are people in this room who have a personal connection, oftentimes a deeply painful connection, to some of the events that we're going to discuss. We need to be treating these subjects with respect and care. I am not going to have any tolerance for folks being disrespectful during a discussion of some of the darkest periods in human history. And I just want to be really clear about that going in. Right? The expectation is that when we start talking about some of these heavier topics, y'all are respectful, both for the sake of the people who are harmed in this, and also for the sake of the people who are still with us today, many of whom have strong connections to this. Um, there are a lot of people in this room who would have been hurt under uh, some of the policies we're going to discuss. Probably more people than you think in this room would have been hurt. But let's talk about Elise Meitner. So Elise Meitner is a Jewish girl from Austria. Uh, and at this point in time, when she is growing up, uh, secondary schools, so things think like middle and high school, they don't admit girls in Austria. Now, in theory, the girls are allowed to go to university, but to get into university, there's an entrance exam. And it's basically impossible to pass the entrance exam if you don't have a high school education. So they've effectively locked women out of higher levels, uh, even if it isn't the rules that you can do. But Lise Meitner comes from a family that deeply values education. Her family is Jewish. Education is like a pretty heavily ingrained Jewish value, as some of you might be aware. Um, and her family cares a lot about this, so they hire private tutors. So basically, she gets two years of tutoring to cram eight years of education into in order to be able to pass the entrance exams and go to university. She is able to go to university and eventually earn her doctorate in physics. Um, Lise Meitner is going to experience sexism throughout her career. Um, there are stories about things like there's a very famous German physicist named Max Planck, and Max Planck is a rule that there are no women allowed in his lecture hall because he thought they were distracting. Uh, and somebody's like, hey, Max, you have to meet Lise Meitner. Like, I know how you feel about women, but just trust me. Once you meet her, you'll see how brilliant she is, and you'll change your mind. And somebody in introduces Max Planck to Lise Meitner, and Max Planck's like, yeah, you're right. This woman is brilliant. My policy is wrong. The policy will no longer be no women allowed in the lecture hall. From now on, the policy is no woman except for Lise Meitner allowed in my lecture hall. So oh, nice. That's crazy. <laughs> um, Lise Meitner will be hired as a professor, but at first they're not even going to pay her money. It's only later when they're afraid of losing her to a different school that they actually start paying her a wage. Um, for a long time, she's like wildly underpaid compared to her colleagues, um, but she is actually fairly high status, and she makes her way up to being a department head. Um, and there's a ton of work that she's going to do that's really important. Um, so Lise Meitner, is the one who does a lot of the work with alpha particles and metal foils that lays the groundwork for Ernest Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Yes, Emily? Uh, no, I've got to keep moving. We've got to tell you about it today. Um, what? She's the person who does a lot of the background research on how to make alpha particles and metal foils that Ernest Rutherford ends up using for that gold foil experiment that we talked about. Basically, like she helps develop a lot of the tools that he will use in that famous experiment. Um, there's a guy named James Chadwick who discovers the neutron, which is this particle that has no charge but does have mass. Uh, she's the person who sends 
James Chadwick, the polonium that he'll need to do that experiment. Uh, and she's actually existing in competition with Irene Curie. So one of the things that people are trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to make an element that is heavier than uranium. Because Marie Curie got a Nobel Prize for doing this, right? So everyone else is like, oh, if I can just discover a new element, then I'll be able to earn a Nobel Prize too. So there are a bunch of different teams that are working on this. There's Irene Curie's team based in France. There's Enrico Fermi's uh, team based in Italy. And then there's Marie, or sorry, not Marie Curie, uh, Lise Meitner and her partner Otto Hahn. Otto Hahn is her lab partner. They're not romantically involved at all. Um, those two are working in Germany out of Berlin. Yes? So she said who the, um, the uh, foil? James, uh, so the foil is used, she's the one who figures out how to use that, and that's later on used by Ernest Rutherford in that gold foil experiment. And then she also sends polonium to James Chadwick, who's the guy that discovered the new one. So she made the foil. She didn't make, the, uh, make like the specific foil to be used. She helps figure out how to do that kind of experiment. Um, at this point, we're getting to the point where pretty much all the people we talk about are gonna like start knowing each other, exist in community with each other. Uh, like here's a photo, and just to show you some of the faces of this photo. Does anyone recognize this guy? Yeah, Einstein. yeah that's Einstein. Here's Lise Meitner. Uh, this is Otto Hahn. Uh, that's Fritz Haber, who's very Einstein? Important. Einstein's here. Yeah. Oh. He looks a little younger. Um, so we're getting to the point where a lot of these people know each other. Now, a thing that we need to talk about is Lise Meitner uh, is a Jewish girl, though she does in later life convert to Lutheranism, who is living in Germany and working in Germany in like the 1930s. And in this period of time, there is a new political philosophy that begins to take hold, uh, not just in Germany, but in lots of Europe. And this political philosophy is called ethno-nationalism. Ethno-nationalism is a deeply evil political philosophy. What it basically states, the core of it, is that a nation should exist for the benefit of people of a particular set, particular group. That a nation exists to serve the needs it's for and run by people from a specific cultural, ethnic, racial, or religious group and that everyone else is not a real member of that state. If, yes, Nadine? What does sterilizing mean? Sterilization means making it impossible for someone to have children. Uh, so ethno-nationalism is this belief that people should, uh, that basically a country exists for a certain set of people. Anytime you've heard somebody express like, oh, so-and-so are the real Americans, and other people are not real Americans, uh, that's ethno-nationalism, right? That's this idea that only a certain subset of the population is who the country is really for. And in the case of the Nazi party, who they believed that Germany is for is white people, Christian people, Aryan people, which is what they called their ethnic group, straight people, cis people, able-bodied people, and members of the Nazi party. Um, there's a fairly large population of black Africans that live in Germany. Uh, many of them have intermarried and have kids. The Nazi party will hunt down every mixed race kid in Germany and forcibly sterilize them in surgeries that do not involve any anesthesia. Um, there will be one of the world's most horrifically efficient genocides that ever takes place. Uh, it will kill, there, there have been other genocides that have killed more people, but none have killed as many as efficiently, as quickly, and as brutally as occur in Germany during this time period. Um, they will kill six million Jewish people. Um, They'll kill members of other religious groups while they believe that Germany is for Christians. They will kill six million Jewish people. They'll kill 1,500 Jehovah's Witnesses, which is a sub-branch of Christianity. Uh, they believe that Germany exists for Aryan people. Uh, there are other ethnic groups, uh, like the Roma and Sinti, 
you might know these people by a different word. Um, that word is a slur. If you've ever heard the word G-Y-S-P-Y, uh, I just misspelled it, G-Y-P-S-Y, that word is a slur. That word is a slur. Uh, you might not know this because in America, this is not an ethnic group that is like an oppressed minority here. That word is a slur, you should not say it. Uh, it refers to the Roma and Sinti people. Uh, my ancestry is Roma. Uh, and between 200,000 and 500,000, so half a million Roma people will also be murdered in the Holocaust. Um, they believe that Germany is for straight people. They'll kill somewhere between 10 and 15,000 gay, gay men uh, in the concentration camps. Uh, they believe that Germany is for cis people. This is a part of the history that doesn't get talked about a lot. Germany actually had a really significant trans population. Uh, it had a lot of research into how to do things like medically transition, how to use hormones like estrogen and testosterone to have people live the lives that they wanted in the bodies that they wanted. Uh, how many of you have seen those pictures, very famous pictures, of the Nazis burning books? Or at least know that book burning was a thing the Nazis did? If you've seen those famous pictures, it wasn't just any old books. That was medical research in how to help trans people, where it was the only copy of that research that existed, and it was destroyed by the Nazis. It set trans people back generations. Uh, they believe that Germany was for able-bodied people. They end up killing 250,000 people with disabilities and forcibly sterilizing another 360,000. Yes. How do you spell sterilizing? Uh, it's here, so sterilized. So if you wanted to replace it with I and G on the end, it would be sterilizing. Yasha? How do you like sterilize? Like, what is that, what is that like? Um, so, there are, so for women, there are surgeries where uh, you tie their ovarian tubes. So you have to cut somebody open and tie a knot in their fallopian tubes. Um, for men, that could mean a, vas a vasectomy, which is uh, cutting the vas deferens, which is the tube that moves sperm from the testes to the penis. Um, so this is not an easy thing. Um, and this was done without any sort of anesthesia. Um, it was part of a, a truly brutal regime. Um, Ethno-nationalism is a deeply evil world. And all of you have a duty to recognize when something is happening in politics that's ethno-nationalism and fight against it tooth and nail. Because this is one of the sort of underlying conditions that you need to have in order for things like genocides to occur. Later on, we'll talk about things like the 10 stages of genocide. Uh, but oftentimes, it has its roots in this idea that a country really exists for a certain subset of the population. When you see things like police brutality in America, that comes from a belief that there are certain people who the law protects but doesn't bind. There's people who the law says, hey, you can't do anything to me. Like, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. And there's a different set of people who the law binds, but does not protect. And police brutality happens because there is a system which views certain people as not being full Americans with full rights. That's what allows folks to have a system that says it's okay to attack this subset of our population. It traces its way back to ethno-nationalism. Whenever you hear somebody yelling about like, oh, like, you're not a real American, or, you know, America should be run by Christians, or by white people, any of those things, or like the real Americans are the ones from the heartland, that kind of stuff, that's ethno-nationalism. And it's a deeply wrong and deeply toxic political uh, view. And we have a, an obligation to make sure that things like this never happen again. And the seeds of it exist already in our culture. Yes, Audrey? It's a good thing that they're like not making it so you can do that anymore because that would be very bad. Um, you say that but a lot of these things do still happen. Uh, the U.S. has sterilized disabled women and immigrants uh, against their will in recent history. There was a pretty recent case of ICE 
uh, forcibly sterilizing immigrant women in the state of Georgia uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, these things are not done with, right? They are ongoing, uh, and we have to fight them wherever we see them. All right, so, yes, Yossi. Um, so what happens to her in that time? Well, at first, Lee Smeitner thinks, this isn't gonna happen to me, right? I'm Austrian, not German, so like, I'm safe, I'm protected by my Austrian citizenship. And then Germany says, you know, Germany is for everyone who has this particular set of characteristics. That includes a lot of Austria, so all of Austria should be part of Germany too. They conquer Austria. Lise Smeitner loses her Austrian citizenship, now she's German. Uh, at first she thinks things like, well, you know, I converted, surely they don't mean me. But to Hitler, uh, being Jewish is simultaneously a re religion and an ethnicity and a race. So that's not going to protect her. Event she stays probably way too long, much longer than she should have. She's pretty late to get out. Uh, eventually, there is a set of laws which are rather euphemistically referred to as the Law for the Restoration of the Professional Civil Service. They're sometimes referred to as the Nuremberg Laws. And these laws make it illegal for people who aren't in that set that are covered under the German ethno-nationalist project to have jobs in government. Basically it says, hey, if you're Roma or disabled or Jewish, you're not allowed to you know, be a postman or a firefighter or a teacher or a cop or a soldier or a government bureaucrat. Everyone who is Jewish or Roma or fits any of those categories is forced out of their jobs, including Lise Meitner. Um, she is no longer legally permitted to work as a professor. Um, and eventually she does decide, I've got to get out. This is dangerous. Um, yes, Yossi? So, wait, what are the rules called? Like the, the Nuremberg Laws? The, the official name is Law for the Restoration of the Professional Civil Service. How do you spell the first one? Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg. I don't remember if this is an E or a U. Or a U. Okay, thank you. But it's something similar to that. So she decides she needs to flee. Now, she doesn't want to leave with all of her stuff because then she'll be picked out as a refugee and folks will be like, oh, are you Jewish? Right? Because if you look at her, it's not immediately obvious that this is somebody who's going to be targeted. Um, so she doesn't want to take anything with her because then folks might realize that she's fleeing the country. Um, Otto Hahn gives her a diamond ring that was his mother's in case she needs to bribe a border guard. Uh, she leaves with basically nothing in her pockets but that diamond ring and she flees. So she does manage to leave the country. Um, she still collaborates. Uh, she and Otto Hahn have like a meeting in Copenhagen where they plan out the next experiments, but she's never again gonna have the same level of access to labs and resources that she previously had. Now, while she is in exile, she and Otto plan a really important experiment. And I will remind you, their goal is they're trying to make an element that is heavier than uranium. So they think, okay, people have discovered, James Chadwick specifically, discovered this subatomic particle called the neutron. And the neutron can, uh, it makes atoms a little bit heavier. So they think, oh, we're trying to discover an element that's heavier than uranium. Let's add this little particle that's heavy into the nucleus and see if we can make a heavier element. So their experiment basically involves firing neutrons at uranium in an attempt to make a new heavier element. Instead, something really weird happens. Because they don't make a new heavier element, they make two old lighter elements. They fire these neutrons at uranium. Now uranium is the element with 92 protons. And then after doing this, when they sort of look at what they've created, they've created two elements. One is called barium, which is the element with 56 protons. And one of them is krypton, which is the element with 36 neutrons. So uranium has, or sorry, not neutrons, protons. Uranium has 92 protons. Barium has 56 protons. Krypton has 36 protons. What do you notice about those numbers? Naya? They add up, and I also notice that Krypton is like super weird. Uh, 
Krypton is a real element. It's a noble gas. It's a colorless, odorless gas that is completely unreactive. It does not at all like the green rock that is described as the kryptonite. Uh, but it's probably the case that kryptonite is named after Krypton. Yes? I don't think of a rock when I heard it. I thought of the cryptocurrency. Oh, yeah. All right. So what has happened here when she fires these neutrons at uranium? is the neutrons lodged in the nucleus, the core, the heart of the atom. They made that core of the atom unstable, and it split into two smaller atoms. So instead of having one nucleus for one big atom, you have two nucleuses of two smaller atoms from two different elements. Now when this happens, they do spit off another neutron as part of it, so a neutron does get sort of thrown off during this. Um, but also, a bunch of energy is released. And so first thing that's happened, Lee Smiter has figured out how to split the atom. That's the first thing. Yes? So she started like the process for the nuclear bomb. Absolutely. Yeah, you would not be able to make this without her. For the nuclear bomb? Yep. Because splitting the atom is a core part of that. We'll talk about why. Yeah, like the fission? This, this is indeed nuclear fission. So the other thing that happens here is it turns out that barium and krypton, if you add up their mass, it's just a little bit less massive than uranium. It turns out a tiny bit of matter has disappeared. It's actually been turned into energy. And Lee Smiter says, okay, if we could set this up just right, it should in theory be possible to split an atom, have it shoot off a new neutron, which hits another uranium atom, splitting it, releasing a neutron, hitting another uranium atom, splitting it, releasing a neutron, you should be able to set up a chain reaction of splitting uranium that would release enough energy to power an entire city or to, blow or to destroy it. So Lee Smeitner figures out how to split the atom and discovers that it is theoretically possible to build a superweapon. This is incredibly important work. The Nobel Prize Committee hears about it, and they decide in true Nobel Prize Committee form that they should give this Nobel Prize to one Otto Hahn. And Otto Hahn says, yes, I will happily accept this Nobel Prize. For sure, thank you so much. I'm glad you agree that my work is so important. Yeah. Well, what no, that, that's what happens. Otto Hahn steals the credit. He takes the Nobel Prize. He takes the prize money. Does he share the money? Uh, no, he does not share what the money. What a jerk. Uh, Lise Meitner uh, will never again have access to the level of resources she had when she was a professor in Berlin. Who knows what else we might have discovered if she had been given the kind of support um, that somebody like Marie Curie had, right? Instead, she lived in a country undergoing uh, an ethno-nationalist project that quickly turned into a genocide. So is that how um, nuclear bombs are made today with like the, with that? Okay. It chain reactions. Yes, so she did that. most of, so did she do most of the work and didn't get credit for She's it? the one who plans the experiment. Um, he has to do the experiment himself because she doesn't have access to the lab. He doesn't understand the results. He sends them to her. She reads all the results and explains to him what happened. So she planned the experiment. She interpreted all the results. That guy's rude for not at least like giving some money to her. Yeah. Emily? We have their letters. We we have their letters back and forth. Like we have the letters of him, uh, like writing to her and saying, "Okay, I did the experiment that we planned. Here's the results I got. I don't understand what's happening." And we have her letters back saying, "Okay, here's exactly what's going on." Nine? Where did she flee to? What's that? Where did she flee to? Uh, she flees to Copenhagen. Uh, Denmark. All right, that's it for today. Tomorrow we will continue with more incredibly depressing topics. Uh, oh! Sorry to be a bummer for a couple of days, but that is going to be what happens.